So when I was taking questions for my 30k subscriber Q&A, the most upvoted question by far was from a user called Chester Bless. Their question was, why was Ariador so depopulated? This is a fairly common question, and while I did answer it in my video, it was a mere two paragraphs worth of explanation. But I think it's a question that deserves a much more detailed answer than that. So in this video, I try to answer, why was Ariador so depopulated? Now, Ariador wasn't always a post-apocalyptic wilderness. At the end of the Second Age, Ariador probably boasted a population of a few million. There were plenty of elves and dwarves still around, a millennia of Numenorean colonization had given rise to the Kingdom of Arnor, which was at its brief peak, and the diverse populations of native men had recovered from the War of the Elves and Sauron that had devastated the region about 1700 years earlier. As you can see from this rough map, most of the lands were populated by a wide array of peoples. Unfortunately, things went downhill from there for Ariador. Arnor took heavy losses during the War of the Last Alliance and never really recovered from it. Even worse, the kingdom would violently split into three in the year 861, and its successors would frequently war with each other, further weakening the Dúnedain. This would allow for internal and external enemies to rise to power, the Hillmen in Rudawa, and of course, the Witch King in the newly founded Kingdom of Angmar. Angmar would launch a brutal 600-year war against the Northern Kingdom. This would result in the annexation of Rudawa in 1409, the final destruction of Cardolan in 1636, and eventually the capture of Fornost and the end of Arthedain in 1974. Angmar's victory was short-lived, as only a year later, it was destroyed by the combined forces of Gondor, the Elves, and the remnants of Arnor. These were brutal wars of extermination. The peoples of Angmar either fled far away or were killed, and the Dúnedain of Arnor were reduced to a mere handful of their former number. War wasn't the only killer, though. In 1636, the Great Plague reached the lands of Ariador, and was especially devastating in the south, resulting in the depopulation of entire regions. And Ariador's climate, especially eastern Ariador, began to worsen around the year 1300, which frequently led to unnaturally long winters, where the lands could be covered in snowfall for as many as five or six months. Following the winters, there would also be devastating floods. All of this leads to an Ariador by the time of the War of the Ring. From a population which may have once hovered in the low millions, by the end of the Third Age, there might not have been more than 100,000 people dwelling in the entire region. There aren't many elves and dwarves left, the Dúnedain are scattered and few in number, and the native men have been greatly reduced as well. The only positive for Ariador was the arrival of the Hobbits, who occupy a decent portion of the centre of the region. But even with their addition, most of the region is entirely, or at the very least, mostly devoid of people. You might say, well, hold up. Ariador is a big place, how do we know it's mostly deserted? Adaptions such as Lord of the Rings Online present Ariador as still having a fair amount of people around. Unfortunately, that's a creative liberty. Tolkien gives us some very definitive hints that Ariador is mostly deserted. First, Tolkien tells us that Bree was the westernmost settlement of men in Middle-earth, which disqualifies most of western Ariador. We're also told that, with the exception of Bree, there were no mannish settlements within 100 leagues of the Shire, or 340 miles, or 550 kilometers, or several million bananas. This map that I have on screen was by a Reddit user named Wolf Wolfpack, and it's worth noting that his exclusion circle starts from the center of the Shire, not the borders, so the exclusion zone could be even larger. Alright, but what about the rest of Ariador? Well, as for Anadwaith and Minhiriath, both lands are described repeatedly as mostly deserted. When the Nazgul pass through, the only men they really encounter are lone hunters who flee, or spies of Saruman who are using the road. Tharbad used to be a major town in the area, but it suffered a long decline and was finally deserted after major floods only a hundred years before the War of the Ring. And after crossing the river Mephithel, Aragorn tells the hobbits that the lands they have entered, formerly known as Rudawa, are also completely deserted. We also know Aragion has been completely deserted for thousands of years as well, and the men who lived in Angmar were also long since destroyed. So yeah, by the War of the Ring, with the exception of small enclaves, only a few of which are densely populated, Ariador is a post-apocalyptic wilderness. 
The few travellers are either well experienced, usually dwarves and elves, or spies of the enemy. There is minimal trade, the roads are in disrepair, the old cities and towns are mostly in ruins, and the wilderness is unkempt and dangerous. Alright, so we know why Ariador became this way, but why hasn't it recovered? After all, it's been over a thousand years since the destruction of Angmar, and since then, as far as we know, at least comparatively to the rest of Middle-earth, Ariador has been mostly peaceful. Why hasn't the population gradually recovered? Why haven't the lands been slowly reclaimed? Why haven't the towns and cities been rebuilt? Why has no one founded a new kingdom? Before I get into that, I just want to say, I do believe there are issues with Tolkien's world building. As great and as in depth he could be, demographics and population growth aren't exactly well represented in his writings. In our world, populations can bounce back fairly quickly from devastating events, whereas in Tolkien's world, well, a thousand years later, and nothing's really changed in Ariador. Obviously, Arda doesn't necessarily follow the same rules as Earth, but it's still a bit unbelievable when populations haven't recovered after such huge lengths of time. That being said, I'm going to explain this as best I can. Quite simply, the reason why Ariador was still so depopulated was because the remaining peoples in Ariador either didn't want to repopulate Ariador, lacked the capability to do so, or both. I'm putting up this map of Ariador again to show you the different remaining peoples, and I'm going to go through the different reasons as to why none of them made a serious attempt to repopulate the region. First, we'll talk the Elves, labelled as Noldor and Sindar, and the Dwarves. The reason why they didn't repopulate Ariador is simple. Both peoples were in the decline during the Third Age. In the case of the Elves, their years of expansion had long come to an end, and they could barely maintain their remaining lands. As for the Dwarves, the last thousand years of the Third Age was a time of great turmoil for them, and they had been rendered homeless on several occasions. They lacked the strength to expand, and with the exception of the Blue Mountains, there was nowhere left for them to really expand in Ariador anyway. Alright, let's talk the Wild Men, the men of Erin Vaughan, the Lossoff, and the Dunlendings. We'll leave the Dunlendings to last as we know a bit more about them, as for the first two, we know very little. Whether the Lossoff even still existed late in the Third Age is unknown, but if they did, it's probable they hadn't changed. Few in number, they lived a semi-nomadic lifestyle in the cold, frozen north. Sure, they could have moved south, but they seemed to be a people who were steeply immersed in tradition and superstition. It's likely they had no desire to do anything other than what they had always done. As for the men of Erin Vaughan, they are described as a numerous yet barbarous fisherfolk by Gandalf. Once again, this implies that they were primitive by most standards, but were also rather content with their situation. They are described as numerous, which would also imply that they had grown and expanded. But the southern coastline of Ariador is quite vast, so perhaps even though they grew in number, they never reached a point of overpopulation that would require them to leave their own lands. And let's talk the Dunlendings. Now, the Dunlendings did actually grow and expand, and seemingly had a more organised political unit than the two aforementioned peoples. But the Dunlendings were not interested in the deforested plains of Anadwaith and Minhiriath. No, they actually expanded south and southeast into Rohan, which would eventually bring them into conflict with the fledgling kingdom. So it's likely that if the Dunlendings wanted to, they could have gradually spread across the lands of southern Ariador. But for some reason, they didn't want to, preferring the more fertile lands of Rohan. Let's move on to the more well-known peoples of Ariador, and first, we'll talk the Hobbits. The Hobbits were probably the largest group, population-wise, that remained in Ariador, likely numbering in the tens of thousands across the Shire. They clearly had a strong growing population, so why didn't Ariador end up as a land filled with halflings? Well, firstly, the Hobbits did slowly expand first into Buckland, and in the early 4th age, they expanded into the hills of the Far Downs. Both regions directly bordered the Shire, and in the case of Buckland, there was already a bridge across the Brandywine from the old days of Arnor. But surely they could have grown quicker, right? Well, maybe, but there's important factors you have to take into account about the Shire. The most important factor is the Hobbits themselves. 
they aren't like normal men. I mean, obviously, normal men aren't three feet tall, but I'm talking about their general outlook. They don't want to repopulate Eriador. Since founding the Shire, hobbits have become insular and unambitious. They were happy with what they had and weren't concerned with what was going on outside their borders. Apart from a few odd individuals, they didn't travel outside of the Shire, and when they did, it was usually only to places like Bree. They also don't have a central government of any sorts, meaning that any expansion would have to be organised by exceptional individuals or by a large family. This is what happened with Buckland, which was settled by the Old Bucks, one of the oldest and most influential families in the Shire. They would end up becoming the Brandy Bucks, by the way. The fact that this only happened once in the Shire's history is a testament to how rare it was. But assuming the Hobbits did want to expand, could they do it? Well, not without a radical change to their society. Namely, the Bounders would need to become a proper military, and the Shire would need actual leaders to direct colonisation efforts. Keep in mind, the Shire only remained so peaceful because A. It was far away and not well known, and B. It had the protection of the Dúnedain Rangers. Expansion would negate the first factor, the Shire would become known. And without a proper military to properly protect their new lands, they would be even more reliant on the Rangers to protect them. The Rangers, being few in number, would be increasingly stretched thin. The men of Bree face many of the same issues. They're also insular and unambitious, although perhaps not to the same degree as the Hobbits, as they do receive their fair share of travellers. They also seemingly don't have a central government or prominent leaders to direct any colonisation efforts. Perhaps apart from a few watchmen in town, they also don't have a military. And compared to the Hobbits, they're also smaller in number perhaps numbering in the low thousands across Bree and its satellite villages of Archet, Coombe and Staddle. So, could they have expanded and reclaimed land? Well, they would stand a better chance than the Hobbits, but it still wouldn't be easy. A family or perhaps a handful of individuals could strike out and perhaps start their own settlement, but this comes with inherent risks. As Aragorn points out, there's dangers within a day's march of Bree that would freeze Balam and Butheba's heart. Dangers that are only kept away due to the rangers. But despite the watchfulness of the rangers, Eriador is still a dangerous place and there's plenty of wilderness for enemies to slip through. So by striking out and claiming new land, you're putting yourself at a great risk. There's more mundane threats such as brigands and wild animals such as wolves or bears, but perhaps a skilled hunter might be able to keep these at bay. However, bands of orcs have been known to raid deep into Eriador from their bases in the Misty Mountains and Mount Graham, even as far as the Shire. And the further east you go, the more likely you are to encounter them, as well as trolls who have moved down from the Etten Moors. Also, choosing to settle too close to places like the Barrow Downs puts you at risk of encountering the terrifying Barrow Whites. It's possible that this has happened, that small groups of people have established successful homesteads beyond the bounds of Bree. This may have been how settlements such as Archet, Combe, or Staddle were founded, but to be fair, all three of those settlements are within a day's walk of the main town. But the further you are from the main town, the more at risk you are, and to most people in Bree, it simply might not be worth it. Why risk life and limb planting your flag in a dangerous, isolated piece of dirt when the town of Bree offers everything that you need in your simple, yet pleasant existence? This brings us to our last group of people, the Rangers of the North, the Dúnedain. Unlike most of the other peoples, the Dúnedain are the one group that do want to repopulate Eriador and re-establish their old Kingdom of Arnor, but they face problems in the late Third Age that prevents them from doing that. Their biggest problem is their small numbers. We don't know how many Rangers there are, but given everything we know, the entire population doesn't seem to be any higher than a few thousand, and is possibly far less. Because of that, their main settlement is apparently hidden away in the Angle, a defensible and remote location. They are also otherwise occupied. The Rangers are the self-designated defenders of Eriador, and have tasked themselves specifically with the defence of Bree and the Shire. This is a dangerous job that plays a major part in why the Dúnedain are so few. Four of their chieftains were actually slain in different ways while carrying out this mission. So whilst the Dúnedain would like to bring civilization back to Eriador, they simply don't have the resources to do so while the threat remains in the east. 
once this threat, Sauron that is, is finally gone, they can begin the long process of bringing life back to Eriador. Speaking of this, how exactly did the repopulation of Eriador proceed in the Fourth Age? We get a little information. Given the low population of Eriador, this would have been a slow process. It started with Aragorn as King Alessa coming north and re-establishing a residence in Anuminas. Over time, the city would have slowly been rebuilt as it attracted settlers, both Dúnedain and Middlemen. The Dúnedain probably would have formed the backbone of the administration, whereas the Middlemen would have taken up a main role as settlers, farmers and builders. It's also said that Fornost was going to be rebuilt as well. While both cities were resettled, it probably would have taken generations for them to become bustling centres of administration and commerce. Of course, to support these new settlements, new fields would have had to be planted or old fields would have to be reclaimed. The transportation of food and other goods to these centres of population would require the repair and maintenance of the old roads. Along these roads, new settlements would be built and old settlements would be resettled. Although it would be a long time before much of the wilderness was reclaimed, it's quite likely that by the end of Aragorn's 120 year long reign, a square of civilization would have sprouted up with its four corners as the Shire, Bree, Fornost and Anuminas. I've also been asked whether settlers from Gondor would have aided this process. Well, I have no doubt that some Gondorians would have went north in some official capacity as part of Aragorn's court and entourage, I'm not sure if there would be a large amount of Gondorian settlers. Nothing like that is ever stated in the books. After all, Gondor wasn't exactly overpopulated, and there was plenty of land there that could now be reclaimed that Sauron and his allies had been defeated, such as Athelion, parts of Anorion, and parts of the coast which had long been under threat by the Corsairs. So to summarise, why did the Riador remain so depopulated? Of course, in our world, after a thousand years, Eriador would have been bustling with civilization again. But many of the remaining peoples in Eriador after the Angmar Wars either had no desire to expand or completely lacked the capability. Eriador was a dangerous place, and for many peoples, trying to stake a claim on the vast tracts of wilderness was more trouble than it was worth. I think a quote by Bilbo best summarizes it. It's a dangerous business, Frodo, going out your door. You step onto the road, and if you don't keep your feet, there's no knowing where you might be swept off to. Thank you for watching this long video. I know apart from sort of special videos I do, it's pretty rare for my normal videos to pass 15 minutes nowadays. I hope you enjoyed it, or at least found it interesting. I have a lot of fun talking about world building, geography, demographics, history and such. It's probably my place of expertise when it comes to Middle Earth, more so than characters. I'd like to thank Chester Bless again for asking this question and inspiring this video. Cheers, farewell, and remember, if you want to live the life of an Ariador colonist, you can. It's called Siberia.